system presents Telephone Time. Telephone Time with Dr. Frank Baxter. How do you do, ladies and gentlemen? Have you two ever had the strange experience of going into a room new to you with a sudden feeling that you'd been there before and that you recognize every bit of furniture, every picture? This is a familiar experience, so common that it has a name, déjà vu. It's one of the curious things that happen to people for which there's no very easy explanation, and there are many such things. Now, this strange story that we're about to tell you was first written down by a distinguished American of the 19th century, Robert Dale Owen. He was a writer, a political thinker, a congressman, and served as United States Minister Abroad. And other people have recounted this story, too. It took place on the Bark Vestris. Robert Norwich, master, 16 days out of Plymouth, England, bound west across the Atlantic for Boston in the spring of the year 1828. This is the way the tale runs, and we call it the Vestris. the captain how lucky the weather has been for your first voyage it's not often we get it as good as this ma'am we're going to plot our position mary come and see how much closer you are to those cousins of yours in boston it is a happy ship you're on ma'am and it is no wonder with such fine sailing as we've had That's where we are, and very good, too. Come over here, Mary. Come on, lass. That's our position. Don't you think we've come a long way in 16 days? There's still a long way to go. <laughs> yes, indeed, ma'am. But at the rate we've been going, it won't be long before we get there. Eight bells already. Excuse me, ma'am. I'll leave the course for the next watch, and I'll be ready for my dinner. 49 degrees, 37 minutes north latitude, 35 degrees, 13 minutes, 20 seconds west longitude. Come three points south. There. Now I'm ready for my... my dinner. I'm famished. Oh, Mary, many's the time I've wished you on board my ship with me. And here you are at last. You brought good luck with you, lass. Never have I known such winds. What is it, Mary? It is nothing. It's foolish to say it's nothing. Is it some pain you have? I tell you, it is nothing. You didn't eat your dinner again tonight. For days you haven't eaten enough to keep a bird alive. It's not like you to be like this, Mary. Like what? For days I haven't seen you smile. You seem lost in some melancholy world of your own. Be you sure you're not sickening for something. Would I not say so if I were? And if it's not a pain in your body, it must be a pain in your mind. You're hiding something from me. You've never done that before, Mary. Is it the sea? I hate it. 
Ah, it does affect people that way sometimes, till they get used to it. The monotony of seeing nothing but water. No, it's not that. It's something deep down. Cruelty. Oh, come now. There's no more cruelty in the sea than there is in the land, with its storms and its fires. I'll tell you something about the sea, lass. When she takes life, she does so a lot more mercifully than does the land. It's the voices that come from it. Voices? Day after day, even in my dreams, I hear them. Saying what? Threaten me with something. Ah, you're being fanciful. That's what I tried to tell myself. It grew louder every hour, as if the threat were coming near. It's cold in here. Where's my straw? The sea's getting on your nerves. It did on mine. It'll pass. I must have left it in the church room this morning. You talk about getting your sea legs. <laughs> getting your sea mind is much more difficult sometimes. I heard a cry out, sir, and came in and found her like this. All right, Mary. You're all right now, lads. Uh, what happened, Mary? Someone was in here. Who? Who was in here? A man. A stranger. All right, back to work. Must have been your fancy, man. There's nobody there. All right, Mary. You're all right now. Come on. Come with me. Get out of here. Tall and thin. But there was no one there. He wore a jacket with a hood over his head. And when he turned and looked at me, his face was like that of death. His eyes were full of suffering. He tried to say something to me. T'was but your fancy, Les. Come now, take a sip more of this. I saw him as plainly as I see you. Why would I lie to you? Who's there? Mr. Lloyd, sir. Oh, come in, Mr. Lloyd. Help me persuade my wife that there was no one in the chart room. Why do you keep saying there was no one there when I say I saw him? He was writing on that slate. Is there nothing on it? Well, is there writing on it? Steer northwest. Steer 
north, west. This is not your handwriting, Robert. No. Is it yours, Mr. Lloyd? No, ma'am, it is not. For one of the men? One of the men to write like that? Why, most of them can't write at all, ma'am. Are you so sure now that it was just my fancy? If there was someone in there, he must have slipped out before you got to Mrs. Norwich. A stowaway, sir? I'll soon find out. Aye. Come now, my dear. You take a rest. We'll get to the bottom of this. Come on. Slow, Mr. Lloyd. She's sleeping. I searched every nook and cranny in the ship, sir, and there's not a trace of anyone. Did you question the men about the writing? I even made those who can write the words. But nobody knows anything about it, and I'm sure they're speaking the truth. Mr. Lloyd, before I ask you for your solemn word that you did not write this, I will give you mine that I did not do so. If the good Lord is my witness, sir. I did not do that writing. And either there was a stowaway aboard, and he slipped out before you got there and jumped overboard. But what sense does that make? But nobody can stay hidden on this ship for 16 days without leaving a trace. Or else my wife, in her disturbed state of mind. But if she did, it's the first time she's ever written in this land. I had the same thought too, sir. But why should she write that? Even she knows that to steer northwest is to take us out of the line of shipping and into the ice floors. Aye, there's no sense in that either. Well, what's to be done now, sir? What else but wait till the truth of the matter comes out? I'll keep this here. Aye, aye, sir. There's another one in the chart room. Yes. 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 Yes, I hear you. Yes. Steer. North, west. This is your wife, your lucky pal. You married more than just a pretty gal. Why, day in, day out, she's the family cook, the maid, chauffeur, hostess, nurse. All of them, her. And when she's dressed up for an evening out, doesn't she look worth shouting about? How does she do it day after day? Well, she plans your life the modern way, by telephone. Helpful, handsome, handy telephone. Right at her fingertips. Right at her side. A telephone on her kitchen wall. She can decide and order, cook, and call. A phone in the nursery, the bedroom, the den. She saves herself trips again and again. Rush steps. Slow steps. Handy phones mean no steps. Friends to meet? When? Trains to meet? Where? Using her phone, give her time to spare. New phones? Wall phones, bright phones, all phones help ease her way through the busiest day. No wonder she's so wonderful. She uses her telephones to help plan your life. Taken all in all, she's quite a gal, your wife. Sixteen days fair weather, sir, so I suppose we can't complain. 
Close in far too quickly for my liking. I warrant you've never seen fog close in that fast. True enough, sir. Which? You hear that? Something is moving there. Who is it? Who the blazes are you? Robert. What on earth? Mary. What are you doing here? You'll catch your death of cold. I had to come to ask you. Ask me what? If you changed course to northwest. What nonsense is this? Come on, back to your bed this minute. You must have taken leave of your senses. You're acting like a child, leaving your warm bed, going to the cold air. Robert, you haven't answered me. Have you changed course? What did I tell you? You're shivering. Here, swallow this down. Robert. Swallow this down at once. <coughs> oh, darling, I... I'm sorry, I didn't mean to speak harshly. Here, come and sit down. I didn't know you were in pain. No, it's not the pain, Robert. I saw him again. That man. Where? In here? In my dream. He kept saying over and over, steer northwest. It was only a dream. Look on his face, like a soul in torment. And his voice. Oh, Robert, you must do as he says. You must, Robert, you must. Your hands are burning. There's a fever in your eyes. Robert, there's more to this than just a dream. I tell you, it's nothing but the fever in you. And I tell you that if I have a fever, it is because of this, not because I'm sick. <laughs> is there nothing I can say to make you believe me? What can I do to make you see sense? I'm warning you, Mary. There's no doctor aboard here to help if you should fall really ill. And that's what you'll do. If you don't throw off this wild fancy and look after yourself. And I'm warning you, Robert. If you do not obey the writing on that slate, you'll bring sorrow to all of us. Do you know what would happen if I did that? I'd be taking this ship and every soul aboard her into the mortal danger of the ice flows that come south at this time of year. Do you expect me to do that? Just because my wife sees things that aren't there and has dreams? Robert, I saw that man. I have heard a voice, and you have seen the writing. There's something at work here. Some power beyond my understanding. I don't know what it is. I do know more surely than I've ever known anything in my life before. That if we do not obey, we will pay for it in bitter sorrow. Mary, put yourself in my place. I can't do it. It would be unreasonable. You don't understand, Robert. You don't understand. I can do no more. It's in your hands now. How's Mrs. Norris, sir? It could be the intestinal fever she's sickening for. Pain in her side, I've seen it before. She's half crazed with that writing. I don't know what to do with her. I, it's been on my mind too, sir. And it's strange, this, this fog coming down out of a clear sky like this, like a sign. You mean to say you think there's something in this? Well, now, sir, they do say that us Welsh do feel things. <laughs> Superstition, they call it. But the trouble is, the people who talk like that, they don't explain. Like where that writing came from, for instance. It's fog, too. Have you noticed now how the wind has veered around to the southeast, sir? Mr. Lloyd, are you trying to advise me to change my course to the northwest? Oh, no, sir, that's for you to decide. But I was thinking that if we ran northwest before this wind, well, just for a bit, of course, we might clear this fog. Might help her to calm down and see sense. 
If there's nothing else. Very well, Mr. Lloyd. Get your sails trimmed. Aye, aye, sir. Enough. Having a woman aboard is bad luck. Yeah. We ought to go talk to the captain about it and do something about it right now. Yeah. Come on, now. Come on, let's go. Come on. You know what we want. Get back off call. This ship ain't ready for Boston. Get back from where you belong. Yeah. I did it. Yeah. You know what yeah. they came up here before they could stop them. We got our rights. Right. Oh, All right, right. 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 right, men. As soon as I get my wife over this attack, I'll turn the ship around. Now get back to what you were doing. Look lively now. Right. Come on where you belong. How is she, sir? Mortal sick. I don't know what the end of this is going to be. Hey, two! Three boys left, seven men! Ah, can we? Now there'll be no handling the men. I told you having a woman aboard would bring us nothing but bad luck. Man, it can't be true. That's what you get for being so far north. It's a nice floor, sir. And the less it's seeing things I am, there's people on it. You're right. There are three of them. Mr. Lloyd, bring her round. Aye, aye, sir. Two of you get ready to lower a boat. Here. Here. We save. They've seen her. We're saved. We're saved. Here, wake up. Wake up. Wake up. Wake up. We're saved. They've seen us. Look. Look! Ahoy! Ahoy! Put it in. Get it in. All the back now. Bring her up close to the ship. Come on, lad. First one up. Quick. Yeah, give us a hand here, mate. Up with him. Take it easy. Right. We got you, Sam. We got Take you. Take it easy now. Hey, Lee. Keep the floor. Lay him down there on the deck. Up with him. All right, sir. All right, sir. All right, sir. All right, lad. Take these men below. Get some uh, grog from the galley, one of you. Aye, aye, sir. Stand by to bring up the longboat. We'll soon have you fixed up. What was the name of your ship? The Morning Star. Hit an iceberg and found it. Of the 35 souls on board, we're the only survivors. We were on that ice for a week. God knows how you found us. It was a miracle. Aye, you're right. As I was passing your cabin, sir, I heard your wife call out. Well, you take care of this gentleman, Mr. Lloyd. What you need first is a good hot grog. We'll fix you up some dry clothes after, eh? Thank you, sir. Thank you for everything. You're very welcome, sir. Your friend's going to be all right. They tell me he's coming round. Oh. 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 Mary, I'll send back to the floor and pick up some ice. It'll numb the pain. There now, Mary, lass. There now. Oh. We'll get back on course and pick up a ship with maybe a doctor on board. Sir, here's a doctor, a surgeon, one of the rescued. Are you really a doctor? Yes, but what seems to be the trouble? It's the intestinal fever, I think. you all right in no time. You hear that, Mary? Robert. Robert. This is the stranger. That day in the chart room. Don't you remember? How long has she been like this? Four or five days. It was... It was four days ago that I saw you. Can you do anything for her, Doctor? Of course he can. Now don't you worry about a thing, ma'am. I'll go get cleaned up. Robert. Now will you believe? Will she be all right? 
Perfectly. She's young and strong. She'll be up and about in a week. Now I'll go see my other patient. Uh, doctor, before you go, would you please write something on this slate? Hmm? The words are steer northwest. Steer northwest? I don't understand. What if you please? Doctor, four days ago, words were written on the other side of this slate. And by nobody aboard this ship. Read them. Well, that's what we're told happened on the sailing ship Vestris in the year 1828. Was all this the result of hallucination, of second sight? Was it mere coincidence? Well, after this announcement, I'll give you the only comment we have to make. Gate 27, all aboard, please. I'll call you, dear, as soon as I get there. Well, Dad's off on another business trip. Hello? Hello, darling. Have a good trip? The children are fast asleep. No, no, here they are. They want to say good night. No matter where you go, it means so much to keep in touch by telephone. There are many phenomena and events that baffle our imagination and understanding, strange occurrences for which there seems to be no easy, rational explanation. Certainly, I don't intend to offer one for this. Perhaps in a hundred years, man will be able to understand what took place in this strange legend of the Vestris. But for the moment, we can't. We brought you this story because it seemed like a good yarn and one quite worth the telling. Now let us look at our story, our true story, for next week. She was a militant pacifist. He was one of the world's wealthiest men. But she hated his work even as she loved him. When tragedy darkened his life, it was too late for her to help. But she is remembered for something that he did. See Jessica Tandy and Hume Cronin in War Against War. And until it's time for that story, ladies and gentlemen, goodbye. for telephone time next week. Until then, we remain sincerely yours, the Bell Telephone System.